Bienvenidos a, a todos y todas. Um, to all of our participants joining us from around the world, we would like to wish you a warm welcome to the 2024 annual meeting for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. My name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm the director of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Hello everyone and buenos dias. It's a pleasure to be with you all in this beautiful part of the world. My name is Camilla Jones and I'm the Deputy Director of the Alliance. So who knows how many annual meetings the Alliance has organized so far? What number are we on? 15, seven. Nine, that's correct. So this is the ninth annual meeting under the Alliance. Of course, there was the CPWG before that, who also was doing that an annual meeting. So we are continu continuing that tradition. So the first four years were in person. Then our beloved COVID hit, and we, uh, we, ha we had to go online. So for four years, we were online. And this is the first year after four years of virtual annual meetings that we are back together. So I wanted to suggest that we cherish that possibility of being together by l turning to your neighbor, shaking their hands, giving them a hug, so that we, we basically appreciate the fact that we are all together. We wanted to also get a sense of who's in the room. So we wanted to first invite those joining us from the Latin America and Caribbean region to just put their hand up and give everyone a wave. <laughs> Hey, not, not so many as we had yesterday, but still a very big contingent. And then for the rest of you joining us from other parts of the world, let's see you. A wave, stand up. Oh, you're not so cheerful as the others. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hani mentioned the many, many meetings that the Alliance has convened. Some of you might not have attended them before. Some of you might have been at all of them. <laughs> Either way, feel welcome. We want you all to feel welcome and enjoy and hopefully come again. So I would like to first thank um, a, few, a few people and entities that helped us organize this. So first, UNICEF, Latin America and Caribbean Regional Office, that is our co-host here who really made this happen and this beautiful venue that we are in. So thank you, UNICEF Lacro. Um, also our generous donors that have helped us make this happen. Uh, US government, particularly PRM, um, Norway, and ECW, um, as well as contributions from some of our steering committee members who had helped either the organization of this or bringing of some of our local uh, actors to, to this venue. So thank you all. Um, and a big thank you for the regional, to the regional group uh, for Latin America and Caribbean on protection of children and, and adolescents in emergencies for organizing a really interesting session yesterday. About, probably about half of you were in that session yesterday. Um, but there will be a little recap for those who were not there. It was a really interesting session, so thank you to those. And I also want to acknowledge our colleagues that were not able to join us today. Um, because of either personal reasons or the sheer capacity that we, we don't have to host uh, the 500 people who actually registered to join us. So if you're online, welcome. So our meeting theme uh, reflects the shocking situation that we find ourselves in today. Um, with escalating uh, conflict and crisis posing challenges for children's protection around the globe. This meeting theme was uh, selected as a top priority by over 200 of our members. So uh, we, we feel that, you know, it's really relevant, it's really current. Um, and it also presents a call to action as to what we might need to do differently in the face of rising needs, restrictions in access, potentially limiting funds, although we'll hear more about that later. Um, so yes. We, we hope that you find it inspiring, interesting, useful. So today we'll start the day um, with the voice of a child, as it's appropriate for a meeting like this, um, a young girl from an indigenous community in Brazil. And we'll then move into an opening session that will bring a bit of global perspective, but also a lack-specific perspective 
to kickstart this hopefully uh, very interesting three days of discussion. And then after this, this morning, we're going to have a marketplace where you can hear from our technical groups. You'll also be able to hear from the regional group that Hani mentioned hosted the event yesterday and the coordination bodies that we have joining us uh, this week. So it'll just be held uh, outside. Um, while our uh, technical groups operate in English, they will also be giving you the chance to sign up to mailings in Spanish. And their stands will stay up during the week, so you can return there if you don't get round the full marketplace. Some of them might, might go there and can arrange to meet you there. Uh, so yeah, just take your time and enjoy getting to know their work, getting to know them. And throughout the three days, we'll have several plenary sessions like this when you're all together in this room. Um, a couple of them that I would mention, one is on resourcing child protection work and one is on protection of children on the move um, among, among other plenary, very interesting plenary sessions. On Wednesday evening, we're going to have a networking event off-site. We'll say a little bit more about that at the end of the day today so you know where you're going to go and how long it's going to take, etc. But we also wanted to start by letting you network, know who's in the room, and maybe find a bilingual friend. So we're going to have a mini networking engagement activity today while the marketplace stallholders set up. And we hope that sets the tone for the week, that you're going to be engaging with each other and sharing. So in addition to plenary sessions and the networking session mentioned, we will have uh, other types of sessions. Uh, there are two kinds of, of curated sessions that are based on the, uh, the, most, the best and the most relevant abstracts that were submitted. Um, they include sessions that group two, or three, uh, two, or two to four presentations, um, as well as some longer interactive or panel sessions. Just to note that this year we received 88 abstracts and 40 of them, just below 50%, were selected to be presented at this year's annual meeting. This year we have a number of child and youth speakers in the room and online, which is fantastic. We have a child safeguarding focal point for the event who's bilingual. Please take note of their contact details, which can be found in the code of engagement sheets, which will be in each room. Um, of course, if you are an adult experiencing any sexual harassment or abuse, we, you can also report this way. This is a local person who knows the local system, and any reports will be treated in the strictest confidence. So we would like to also extend our gratitude to a large number of uh, our colleagues from across the Alliance that are going to be facilitating the sessions this week. So if you're a facilitator, it was nothing. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, if you're a facilitator, can you raise your hand, please? So as you can see, there is quite a number of people who have been working for months to help us um, curate and, and organize this, uh, this session, the content of this session. So in addition to all the logistics, these people are behind the content. So when you go to their sessions, um, I really encourage you to go up to them after the session and thank them for all the work that they have, they have put into this. And for our visual learners and those with diverse language needs, we have an artist with us today, Alex, <laughs> giving you all a wave. He's going to be doing a live drawing of uh, many of the sessions. Um, so you might want to go and have a little peek over his shoulder. Um, but we'll be using those in our post-event comms. So if you're a facilitator run running a session or if you really loved a session and want to promote it when you get back home, they will be in English. Um, but yeah, please feel free. We'll be sharing those and in I hope you enjoy them. Um, also at lunch, um, if you prefer to sit down, you can come back in the room here with your lunch. But we also know some of you are a bit jet lagged, so we wanted to give you the chance to be out there in that beautiful lobby with the natural light. So there are some tables you can stand up and have a standing lunch, also get your steps on your pedometer uh, if you prefer. And there is a free Wi-Fi, it's UNICEF LACRO. Please use that one rather than the other ones listed. Great. Uh, so all the morning sessions, the, the three days that we are together, will be live streamed. Um, so be aware of that and potentially share with your colleagues who, who were not able to come to, um, to tune in to Alliance uh, social media to be able to watch it. Um, 
but all the other sessions will also be recorded and will be made available in multiple languages after the session. So you will all have access to that uh, through our uh, social media channels. Also, we wanted to make sure that you all take advantage of being in person again and, of course, catch up with your existing colleagues and friends, but also meet new people. That way we ensure that we go, out, we go out of this place with a larger network of our colleagues, but also for those who may not know many people to feel more at home uh, and welcomed here. Okay, so that's about it from us for now. Um, we're now gonna hear from our fabulous keynote speaker. She will be speaking in Portuguese with English subtitles. So just letting you know in case you need to turn your volume up, put that headset on if you haven't already. I say this because she speaks very fast. Uh, and you want to hear what she has to say. So just make sure you've got your tech set up, and in a moment we'll have the video come up. And uh, welcome. Welcome. Olá a todos. Meu nome é Thaisa Cambeba. Cambeba não é o meu sobrenome. É o nome de um povo que vive em várias regiões do Brasil e até no Peru. Tenho 13 anos e moro na aldeia Tururucariuca, na Amazônia, Brasil. Neste momento, estou representando crianças de vários países da América do Sul, especialmente aquelas que compartilham a floresta amazônica. Todos sabemos que as mudanças climáticas estão impactando o nosso planeta de maneira alarmante. Os incêndios estão devastados, as florestas estão liberando gases de efeito estufa no meu estado. A fumaça dos incêndios é tão espessa que mal podemos ver. É terrível, mas parece que quem não vê são aqueles que estão causando esses incêndios. São os que não conseguem ver nada. Eles estão recusando a ver o óbvio. Precisamos discutir o impacto das mudanças climáticas e como ela ameaça nossas vidas e os nossos direitos. Mais uma vez, proteger as crianças anda de mão dadas como proteger o ambiente onde crescemos. Isso é algo que precisamos abordar urgentemente. Precisamos de agir agora. Quer dizer, vocês precisam agir agora. Precisamos do seu compromisso para que isso aconteça. Todos também precisam adotar práticas saudáveis em suas vidas diárias. Todos precisam ser exemplos do que pregam. Nós, povos indígenas e ribeirinhos, já vivemos dessa maneira. E o nosso modo de vida é um convite à esperança. Nosso estilo de vida segue os tempos e os limites da natureza e vivemos em harmonia com a floresta e protegemos as nossas crianças. Temos muito a ensinar e a compartilhar em um momento em que aprendemos é essencial. Valorizem conhecimentos indígenas e ribeirinhos. Apoiem nossas ações. Entendam nosso modo de vida e nos ajudem a promover o nosso modo de vida saudável e respeitoso com a floresta. Nós protegemos e vivemos na floresta em que todos precisam para sobreviver, a floresta amazônica. Precisamos de ajuda. A minha geração está em perigo. Colaboração é a palavra no momento. E se colaborarmos uns com os outros, podemos trazer esperança juntos. A próxima conferência ambiental, COP30, será na Amazônia. Talvez, se agirmos agora, quando vocês vierem para o Brasil, possamos celebrar conquistas e não apenas reclamar das consequências. Não precisamos de mais alertas, precisamos de ações. Faça sua parte, colabore e, por favor, não se recuse a agir pelo óbvio. Chito Manito, muito obrigada. Very powerful words uh, from our um, girl from an indigenous community in Amazon. Um, a huge thanks goes to World Vision for organizing this for this annual meeting um, because they have worked with this girl before and they helped us put together this, uh, um, this opening remarks from, from her, encouraging us to act. And I think that's probably the, the very clear message that we're getting from this. Um, so whether it is about um, preserving the, the environment or it is about protecting children, action is, is asked for by, by children. So let's hear, keep that in mind. And, and also another very positive thing that she mentioned is let's, uh, let's not just complain, 
but also uh, but have something to celebrate, right? So we need to have something to celebrate, hopefully, this time, but also next time we meet together. So I'll be inviting our, our panelists for the, uh, for the first part of the opening session uh, up here. So I'll start with Shima Sengupta, who is the Director of Child Protection for UNICEF. Um, uh, Shima's UNICEF career spans both development and complex humanitarian context. She has been a country representative in Iraq and deputy representative in Afghanistan and Bangladesh, and you all know those contexts. Um, prior to these, Shima was Chief of Child Protection um, in Somalia and Ghana. So Shima's UNICEF car career spans um, child protection, um, but also both development and, um, and humanitarian settings. Shima holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and actually has practiced um, as a psychologist and worked in Calcutta, Samaritan, Samaritans prior to joining UNICEF. So Shima will, um, as, as representing the host, will open the meeting and then I'll invite the rest of the panelists up. Um, thank you, Hani. I don't know whether I'm really opening the meeting because I think our keynote speaker just did that. That was so powerful. It's a tough act to follow. She was fantastic. And I think what she said resonates with, I saw lots of nods in the room, so I know it resonates with most of us. But what I am going to do is, um, as a co-host, I'm, I'm going to do the formal uh, welcome, I guess. So honestly, I think we heard from Hani and from Camilla you know, the series of uh, Alliance meetings that we've had, um, you know, and each time when you've had face-to-face -face ones, what it's meant and how it's evolved. So for us in UNICEF, it's a big honor to be hosting this annual meeting for child protection in humanitarian action with the Alliance. Um, it's a big job. I know the Alliance carries this, you know, throughout the year through various humanitarian contexts. So it's really a pleasure. Um, this is the first time, as we heard, since 2019 that this community has come together in person. So, of course, we are going to make the most of it. Um, the agenda is exciting and it's critically important. Uh, given the context of humanitarian needs in the world today. The child protection impacts of exponentially growing conflicts, climate displacement, as we just heard, and migration demand our full attention. So I'm actually very excited by the lineup of sessions, presentations, and exchanges for the week. And I'm sure the marketplace is also going to be very exciting for us to learn from each other. It's really um, an extraordinary opportunity for all of us here to learn from each other, but also to share because there's so much that we don't always know is happening around the world. So for me, this meeting is particularly exciting because it's held in Latin America, where there has been an outpouring of interest and case studies have been extraordinary. The Alliance has taken strides to ensure greater accessibility in language and time zones, and this region it has responded with contagious enthusiasm. So gracias. I would really like to thank the Alliance Secretariat, um, the working group and task forces, and Alliance members for the hard work that goes into bringing together an annual meeting of this size and caliber. Everything looks so set and calm and um, exciting, and everyone's just waiting to see how it unfolds. But I know it's taken a lot of work from a lot of you um, across time zones. Um, so thank you so much for that. I also take this opportunity to thank the experts, the practitioners and the members of governments who are presenting and participating in the proceedings, including those joining us online. And that's, I think, in many ways more difficult than it is to be in a room full of people because you've got to be there and the time zones and all of that. So really appreciate that. For me, attending a conference like this is a pleasure. It's a privilege. 
and also a responsibility. And I do believe it's the same for many of you, if not all. We have a responsibility to commit ourselves fully to being here, taking back to our respective contexts what we've learned and to advance the agenda globally. I was saying to Tasha as we walked in that, you know, this is so exciting for me. As you heard from Hani, I started in an NGO many, many years ago um, in Calcutta, working on the streets with children. And it always excites me to come back and to have the opportunity to learn and share from the practitioners. So my own commitment to you is to redouble my advocacy efforts for children and for child protection practitioners in all these contexts. UNICEF has been a proud co-lead of the Alliance since 2016, and we are glad to see this network flourish as it supports practitioners in the field in their efforts to protect children against all forms of abuse, exploitation, neglect, and violence in humanitarian and fragile contexts. And as we all know, those contexts are increasing. On behalf of UNICEF's regional office, and New York headquarters. A big welcome to all of you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shima, uh, for helping us reopen, uh, or double open, uh, the meeting. Uh, please take a seat here. So I'll invite the rest of the, the panelists. So we we'll also have Riyad Al-Najem, who is the co-founder and chief executive director um, officer of Child Guardians, who many of you know as Haras Network. Um, Riyadh was born in 1991, and he discovered his passion for human rights, particularly children's rights, when he volunteered with the Syrian Red Crescent. Um, in addition to being the CEO of uh, Haras Network, Riyadh also co-leads um, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, uh, and this happened during the past year, so we now have a local organization that actually co-leads the Alliance. Uh, and he co-chairs the localization advisory group for, of the Alliance and the steering committee member of, I can't pronounce the name, uh, Sirs, Sirsk Svenska of SSDF, um, and a board member of We Exist Advocacy Alliance. So Riyad holds, uh, holds a master's degree in business development in NGO settings and mainly focuses on enhancing management uh, modules for nonprofit organizations. Welcome, Riyad. Uh, we also would like to welcome uh, Bill Forbes, who is the global lead of child protection and participation for World Vision International. Um, Bill provides strategic leadership to World Vision's efforts to strengthen uh, local prevention and response to abuse, exploitation, and neglect of children, as well as strengthening children's voices and participation in the world's most difficult places. Previously, Bill worked for World Vision in Cambodia for eight years, providing leadership to the Peace and Justice Program, which included a special focus on peacekeeping and on trafficking and sexual exploitation and abuse of children. Bill has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in international development. Welcome, Bill. Uh, so now that we have our uh, panelists here, I'll I just wanted to take a moment to uh, refresh our memories and test everyone's, uh, of me everyone's memories. Uh, I'm sure everyone has read the, the background paper. Is that true? Um, so maybe next slide, please. And one more. Next, please. Yeah. So what percentage, so the one on the left, what percentage increase have we seen in the number of conflicts from 2020 to 2023? 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, that's correct. Well done, Eleonora. Um, so 40% increase, that's an insane number. Percentage of children living in conflict zone worldwide has obviously increased, but doubled, tripled, or quadrupled between 1990 and, 19, and 2019. I heard something from this side? Tripled, yes, that's correct. Um, next slide, please. One more test of your memory. 
Oh, the other way, the other way. You're going backwards. Forward, forward, yes. So in 2023, the number of forcibly displaced people uh, globally reached a record high of 114 million, including 43 million children, which is 40%. Now, what percentage of the population is comprised of children globally? So if 40% of those displaced are children, is it 40% of the global population that is children? 30%. So children are significantly overrepresented in displaced populations. Now, the reason I wanted to remind us of all these numbers is that it's interesting that these numbers just become numbers and they lose their significance. I mean, how insane is it that we have 114 million people displaced, 40% uh, children, or the number of conflicts uh, going up by 40%. It's, these, are, these are not normal numbers. So I just wanted to remind ourselves that it's part of our job to not allow these to become normalized, that we need to repeat them, not in a way that, to normalize them, but in a way to really shake each other and ourselves and say, how in the world are we living in a world that has these numbers? So I just wanted to start with that, and then I'll now go to our panelists. Okay, I'll start with, uh, with Shima. Um, Shima, as you have seen in the background paper and, and here as well, um, armed conflict has, has gone up significantly in the past few years. As we said, 40% more between 2020 and 2023. And uh, also we have seen in the past two, year, um, two years, we have seen most conflicts ever since the, uh, the end of World, Second World War. And the percentage of children living in conflict um, has, has uh, nearly tripled, tripled from 1990 to 2019. And approximately 400 million children, one in six, live in conflict-stricken areas. Now, please tell us more about your experience and what UNICEF is seeing on the ground in terms of impact on children of what, and what needs to happen. Thank you, Hani. Um, it does, you know, we do pause to think, right? As Hani said, it's not just the numbers, but if you actually pause and reflect, it is much more than that. But as you said, Hani, indeed, there are more than 460 million children across the globe who are living or fleeing from conflict zones. Um, and this is a huge number, you know, it's like the number, it's like the population of, of countries. So just imagine that if you have a whole, you know, a huge country full of children just fleeing or living in such conditions. What we have seen, and we know this, and all of you in this room know, so please, I don't mean to preach, but just putting all our experiences together, I think, um, because UNICEF's experience is UNICEF's, but it's also a sum total of our partners' experiences, right? Um, so in war, as you said, but we also know children are the first ones to suffer, right? Um, and they suffer the most. Um, they lose their family members and friends. They stop going to school. Schools disappear. They're sexually abused, killed, injured. Um, often there are unexploded ordinances and weapons. And these then, you know, when they're out playing, um, injure them or kill them. They're recruited and used by armed groups, armed forces. Um, they're multiply displaced many times from many different places. They keep moving. They're at risk of being separated from their families, friends, everything that has always meant so much to them. Um, and the infrastructure that they depend on, you know, schools, medical facilities, uh, water, power plants, even playgrounds, all of those are attacked, destroyed, disappear from their lives. And then when they need it most, um, humanitarian access to deliver services, it's gone, right? Either it's gone or they can't access it, it's denied. So since 2005, what we've seen is um, grave violations obviously have been increasing 
the UN has verified more than 350,000 uh, grave violation incidents. Um, and now it's much more than ever before in conflict situations. So really, honey, I sound like I'm painting a very depressing picture, but that is the truth, right? But as you said, and as each one of us know, behind each of these numbers is a story of a child and of a family whose lives have been forever changed. Where I mean, Eve, it, it just doesn't go back to where it was. Um, and my experience, as you heard from Hani in the beginning, I've worked in many of these contexts, and my experience actually mirrors UNICEF's experience. I started out, I came into UNICEF ask, being asked to write a psychosocial, a mental health and psychosocial strategy for natural disasters, um, and to work in strengthening justice systems for children. But as you heard, over the course of my career, I've, I've worked in many conflict settings. Sri Lanka, Somalia. Bangladesh was supposed to be peaceful, but then the Rohingya, the Rohingya crisis happened. Afghanistan, Iraq, and you know, it just continues. Um, but I've learned from each of these experiences. And really, it's about how, how important it is to look for those entry points entry points during the conflict, of course, and after the conflict. And, you know, I just came back from Ethiopia three days ago. And what struck me is women and children there telling us that they were better during the conflict than after, because there are no resources after the conflict. We don't stick around after the conflict. We in this room don't, because we sometimes don't have the resources to continue. And I think that's that's very, very important. We need to be there. We need to continue after the conflict to help build back those lives. Um, and, and more and more, honey, we are seeing challenges to this because of the lack of resources to continue. And I think to me that's really worrisome extremely worrisome because we are leaving these kids, these women, these communities at a time when they're most fragile. So that's, that's really um, quite, quite something. UNICEF believes, and, as, and so do I, that we must invest in people and people who are the backbone of this child protection workforce. Um, our social workers, our community workers, the first responders, basically everybody in this room, right? That's the most important. And often that's what I hear from the communities that, you know, the, the banners and the signs of the projects disappear, but there are the community workers who remain behind and continue to support them and find ways to support them. And this is why it's so important for us to invest and invest in people like you in this room here today. Um, we need to find better ways to collaborate. And we just heard our keynote speaker talk about collaboration. We need to learn to engage children and communities um, in designing the program right from the start. Um, it also means delivering programs that are tailored to local realities. Again, we were reminded of that. Don't tell us, ask us, learn from us. And I think we really have to do that. Learn from local communities, learn from the lessons that we have learned and share those that evidence. Extremely important. One, maybe an example, I think, but we talk about child reintegration. This is actually a very good example. If we see over the years, UNICEF has you know, supported tens of thousands across all these different uh, conflicts. And these children have exited from armed forces, armed groups, and have been supported to rebuild their lives, be reintegrated into their community, communities. Um, we've learned many lessons, and some of these actually, the lessons that we've learned from them apply across all other conflict situations and armed, whether it's armed violence or armed conflict, it is more or less the same experiences. Because the children, the experiences of the children, whether in an armed conflict or in an armed violence, is more or less the same. 
um, whether the group's objective is criminal or political, often the scale, the intensity, the types of violence, the exploitation that the children face are all the same. Um, over the course of my career, it's, it's, it feels good to sit here and look at all of you because someone just asked me at my table, how long have I been with UNICEF and Child Protection? It's 24 years. And I know some of you, Bill, I'm sure will have uh, something like that to share. Um, child Protection has grown. It's matured, it's become professional. You know, there were all those days when we just went instinctively and tried different things. But now we know, we've learned from each other, we've documented that. Um, so really, it's a pleasure. And all of you sitting here and this annual meeting is a proof of that. So what we need to do is what we said, we need to cross learn, we need to learn from each other. Uh, and I think this here, this week is a good opportunity um, and learning what works and so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but also re uh, new approaches because some of you have tried it and proven mm -hmm. that it works. These are challenging times. Resources are scarce. Conflicts keep increasing. Humanitarian situations increase. So the more we can learn from each other, um, I think we will be more efficient. Um, so we need more solidarity. We need to stand with each other for the children. I think that's very important. Thank you very much, Ima. Uh, a lot of gold in there. Just for the sake of time, I'll move swiftly to ask a question to Bill. Um, Bill, the climate change um, issue has become the biggest driver and increase in humanitarian crises recently with ex extreme weather events now eight times more frequent than 20 years ago again one of those numbers that is just a number but it's very significant um, around 1 billion children are at high risk of being affected by climate crisis now even not even mentioning the impact that climate crisis has on other types of comp uh, of crises like right comp armed violence and armed conflict uh, please share with us world vision's experience of what you're witnessing on the ground and how this is impacting children's well-being and protection how's that yeah thank you honey and thank you shima for those really wise words um yeah what we're seeing on the ground is what you all are seeing on the ground as well, uh, is that climate-induced crises, the impacts of climate-induced crises, like other humanitarian crises, fall most squarely and deeply on children. Um, and while the connection between climate change and child protection issues is not always clear to everyone and is certainly often overlooked by the media and by politicians, uh, we are seeing very significant increases caused by climate change of many forms of violence against children and i'm sure you can all say the same affirm that of course much of this comes down to uh, the economic disruption and the corresponding stress that households and communities are feeling and we know from humanitarian situations for decades and at the local level even at the national level and even at the global level and global level when we think about the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic that when households come under increasing stress and livelihoods pressures and loss of income we see increases in physical violence emotional violence and sexual violence against children and we're seeing that all over the world these days we're also seeing that we're seeing dramatic increases in negative coping mechanisms as the families and the caregivers con Nav try to navigate this loss of assets, loss of income generating opportunities, often dislocation due to conflict and other climate induced uh, challenges, uh, disruption in schooling. These are all drivers, as we know, of negative coping mechanisms like child marriage and child labor. And we're seeing increases around the world in those coping mechanisms and also a heartbreaking thing that we're seeing is that the the negative impacts of some forms of violence are aggravated by climate change for example child marriage i was in uh, the south of ethiopia a few months ago the southern part of ethiopia in a terrible climate change induced uh, famine and drought 
unbelievable. The worst on record, the worst on, in historical record there. So many people were dying every day. So much livestock had died. And so we went to a food distribution. Then we went to an acute malnutrition feeding center where there were, it was heartbreaking. There were babies and their mothers or babies and their grandmothers, if their mothers had already died, that were on the edge of starvation to death. It was desperate. And when we heard from the clinic, the, the leader of that clinic, the acute malnutrition feeding center, she spoke to us. And we were not a child protection delegation. This was a, just a humanitarian response delegation, just learning. She said to us, without any solicitation, if we want to stop acute malnutrition, the worst ways that this climate-induced famine is, is impacting people, if we want to stop that, we need to stop child marriage and teenage pregnancy. And that was unsolicited. She made that connection. She said that the people who end up in the worst conditions are the young mothers whose bodies cannot sustain themselves in these conditions and cannot help the babies develop. And that was very moving to me. Also, as we listen to children around the world, children make this connection all the time between the, the anxiety and the stress that climate change is causing them. The majority of children, as we know in every global survey, talk about climate-induced stress and anxiety, but they also make the connections to forms of violence. We did a recent survey in the Middle East of uh, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and in that context, uh, children shared a lot about anxiety and sadness and feel of loss of control of their future, but also they talked about increases in physical violence and not feeling safe. And the majority of children made that connection themselves to increases in violence in the home, in the community, and practices like child marriage and child labor. Also, if we look at the general comment number 26 the on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which was focused on uh, child rights and the environment, we saw the input that children gave to the drafting of that general comment often made that connection as well, which was remarkable. So really, child protection has to be part of the climate change agenda. It really does, in part because to any, any efforts that are successful in alleviating or reducing the impact of climate change will address some of the drivers of violence against children. And also, there needs to be adequate climate funding to focus in investing in prevention and response to issues like child marriage, child labor, physical violence, sexual violence, emotional violence against children, because these are direct consequences of climate crisis. So as we engage in working for climate justice, as we try to address children, children's rights and the way that they are violated, and we try to address the most intense climate-induced vulnerabilities, we are actually echoing the sentiments of children and adolescents around the world when we hear from them. So I just want to finish by reading a quote from a child. This is from Shania, an adolescent from Tanzania. She said, we are the least responsible for climate change, we children, but we are the most affected by its impacts, and that is not fair. Governments of all countries need to take bolder decisions and act quickly and decisively, and they need to do it now. So thank you to Shania and all the children that have helped us. Thank you very much, Bill. And thanks for, again, bringing the voice of the child back into, into this, which is extremely important. Um, Riyad, I would like to move on to ask you a question uh, about forced displacement. As we saw, the number of uh, for forcibly displaced people has increased to 114 uh, 14 million and over 40 million are children. Now, due to protracted nature of a lot of the uh, conflict, a, a majority of these children will likely not have the chance to, to go back and will live in displacement for a good chunk of their, their childhood and potentially adulthood. Um, and this means that they face disruptions in access to education, healthcare, uh, and social protection and other services. Uh, so children affected by forced displacement and statelessness face heightened risk of violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation. Now, you as uh, a Syrian yourself, uh, and as someone who has worked to alleviate the suffering of Syrian children who are displaced both inside and outside of, of your country, um, how do you see the impact of forced displacement on children? 
Thank you very much for the question. Uh, indeed, the forced displacement has been an ongoing issue in Syria for over 13 years now. Over half of the population in Syria are displaced, either internally as IDPs or externally as, uh, as refugees. Um, so uh, um, it is a, a, a critical uh, issue, not only here in Latin America, but like most of, uh, of the, the crisis around the world. Um, uh, now, this morning, I've learned that my children, they don't understand me when I speak during my work, which is alarming. So I want us to shift our perspectives a little bit towards children. Like, let's think about this from a child perspective. We are technical and usually tend to complicate things a little bit. So imagine that you are a child who's without any explanation, without any preparation, had to flee your your uh, town um, you've left your school your neighborhood your friends uh, your toys your books familiar faces and places and had to break on a dangerous and hard uh, trip this disturbance in uh, uh, your life would be the the start of many other challenges that you will face for a starter um, uh, you, you will lose your access to education, which would have a profound impact not only on your immediate learning, but also like the long term uh, um, uh, impact on, on, on your education. Um, and your chance, chances of going back to school would decrease day after day if you don't have immediate access to education. On the other hand, for uh, health services, if you don't you usually will not have access to, to uh, um, essential health services, which would increase the chances of uh, malnutrition, um, like uh, treatable diseases and, uh, um, uh, and basic injuries that will not be treated. Um, and this would have an effect on your health longer term. Um, in addition to that, um, the psychosocial impact is also severe. Um, as many children, you would have been subject or witnessed violence, which would leave you with uh, things that most children would not be able to uh, uh, express themselves without like uh, uh, adequate PSS uh, as, uh, activities or, or working with people who, who understand the impact of, uh, of forced displacement. This would leave them with long-term uh, psychological issues like PTSD and anxiety and uh, uh, depression. And we're, we're seeing this in Syria uh, recently. Um, um, moreover, like uh, uh, the exploitation risks would be uh, uh, higher, they will increase. Uh, as many children, uh, you would be subject to child labor, to uh, uh, child recruitment, um, and early marriage. Um, so this is basically due to the breakdown of the community structure and the, uh, the and and your family which would make them like uh, um more vulnerable to neglect and and abuse this is all assuming that you have not been separated from your from your family which would open the door for a totally like uh, more complicated uh, uh, um, issues um so just to uh, summarize, uh, forced displacement would have a profound uh, impact on, on children, especially when we're not prepared, especially when the community itself uh, uh, would face a sudden problem and they would need to be on the move uh, uh, immediately. This would put the children at risks in terms of education, healthcare, uh, psychosocial support, or their uh, um, uh, psychological health, MH, uh, MHPSS uh, 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 risks. Um, and uh, um, this is why it is super important in those settings to, to have children back in their routines uh, as soon as possible because this disruption would lead to, to more uh, and more complicated uh, issues. Uh, so this is like the first thing we think about uh, uh, as children like what do we do every day and how can we go back to to our normal day which would allow us to express and cope uh, uh, with our problems
Thank you very much, Riyad, uh, for that very uh, relevant perspective and bringing us again into the shoes of children. Um, I'm, maybe I'll continue actually with you, Riyad. Um, so, how are local and national child protection stakeholders enhancing the existing CP systems to address new crises? More specifically, in what ways can localized and contextualized social service workforce strengthening and wider facilitation of local actors help us in this situation? Well, uh, every time I'm asked a question about localization, I find it very, very challenging to answer. It is one of the most agreed upon principle, yet it is the big elephant in the room. Um, so basically, uh, I need to convince you with something that you are already convinced with, right? Um, um, the the um, integrated uh, integration of local uh, structures and local communities in the child protection uh, uh, services uh, is essential. Basically, here you would be talking about uh, acceptance of the communities. You're talking about sustainability. You're talking about access which is something that should be like the, the, the principle and the start of any uh, of our response, uh, of our responses uh, uh, um, to crisis. Um, take, for example, the child protection committees and the uh, implementation of, uh, of, of this in, uh, during crisis. They play a critical role in monitoring and reporting child protection issues uh, to, to us who usually would be working in Syria, at least cross-border, and like we don't we don't live the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, struggle that that people that people do. So integrating those local structures into our responses would make them more sustainable and more adequate and and response to the real needs of of the people. Um, furthermore, it this would allow to like decentralized implementation of decentralized uh, uh, services. This is especially uh, uh, important during displacement. Um, in Syria, we've seen that uh, um, with respect to all people who, who are responding in Syria, but when you have like a displacement wave, usually international uh, services that are in the area would evacuate their uh, uh, staff and would like uh, con like the safety would be their first concern. Like and then after weeks they would come back and look. Okay, what do we do now? While when you implement uh, such services locally and integrate them into the community, the service itself would move with the displacement wave which like allows you to just access all the people in uh, the most remote area or underserved area. And we've seen this a lot uh, in Syria. Um, thirdly, like when, when you allow local actors to, and here I'm not talking only about NGOs, we have the tend to, to see that localization is working with local NGOs. It is not. It's lo working with local community. It is NGOism or NGOing the response, which is not what we need here. Um, so when you work with local communities, you would have a greater chance of acceptance, uh, a greater chance of, of having your response uh, uh, respecting local norms and addressing uh, um, real needs and real issues that, that people uh, are facing instead of enforcing uh, uh, different agendas or like a uh, program that you have tried somewhere else that doesn't really uh, uh, work in, in this setting. Um, so this is why localization and working with local uh, communities is super important. And for me, the, the main issue here, the main takeaway would be sustainability. We're, we're, we will not last in one setting. We will not be here forever. At one time, either uh, when we finish the program or when the fund decreases, we need to leave. So what are we leaving those community with is the question here. It's a very, very good point. Uh, many points, but particularly this last point, which I think Shima also brought up in the beginning, this idea that we leave and everything drops, right? Um, and during COVID, I think, was a very clear slap in, in, in a lot of our faces of, 
us not being able to be there, whereas the local local communities and local organizations continued providing services that we couldn't provide. So really thinking about that element. And as you were talking, Riyadh, it reminded me of once, I don't know if um, you remember this yourself, one of the, it was the first year or so that um, Huras Network had joined the steering committee of the Alliance. And we were trying to get a hold of Riyadh and for weeks we couldn't, we, we were not getting any answers to WhatsApp. And then, of course, he comes back after a while and he says, I was in the field evacuating people, which was um, a really interesting kind of reminder that a lot of those that work for larger organizations, they don't have that direct contact. They, it's their security people who go and evacuate. It's not every single member of the organization now mobilizes. You may be doing job protection, but now it's your, your job is security. Your job is to evacuate. Uh, people, right? So it's a, it's that closeness with the community that gives you that, um, that that the edge, that then leads to sustainability of the work. Bill, um, on the way back to uh, to this side of the table, um, how are our, our approaches to protecting children needing to change as a result of decreased humanitarian access and limited funding? And in responding to this, if you can uh, specifically speak to issues of accountability and working across sectors, which are, as uh, you know, two, two of the priorities of our, of our strategy. Yes, thank you, honey. You're right. We are seeing decreases in struggles with humanitarian access. As you said, even unpredictably, we think we have access and then the next day we don't and decreases in funding for child protection humanitarian action and, and actually humanitarian response overall we're seeing significant decrease in funding so just three points related to that one of the first of which relates very much to what you just shared Riyadh thank you we need to continue working in ways which acknowledge and are built on an acknowledgement of our dependence on local actors not just local CBOs but local actors um, we have to be working in a way which engages local actors including children including caregivers, including community-based organizations and civil society of all types, including faith-based communities, including local governments, traditional leaders. Of course, we can bring and need to bring insights and learning and best practice from externally, but we need to bring that in a way that uh, local actors authentically are engaged as co-leaders and co-owners. That it's not about just imposing an external agenda uh, because one just for effectiveness purposes completely but when we have this unpredictable dynamic contexts of conflict and then we add on to that the unpredictability of funding where we think we have funding and then next year we may not we have to work in ways which acknowledge that these actions need to be locally driven and locally owned, even in our humanitarian work. And we've often used this sort of humanitarian life-saving mindset as it doesn't relate until we get into a more sta stable, con but it's not true. The more unstable the context is, the more we have to acknowledge our local dependence because these people may not be here tomorrow. So, or we may not be here tomorrow. There could be anything that can happen. And so we need to be working in ways which acknowledge that dependence and engage, bring the best learning, but and do that in a way that engages the local actors as the leaders. Secondly, we need to be working to advocate for necessary resources. With this, with this reduction in resources, we all need to be taking particularly the, the reality of the ground where you all work and where we have the privilege to be connected in our work. Uh, that needs to be brought in advocacy for the uh, necessary resources. And this includes, of course, international organizations, national organizations, agencies advocating, but it also includes us trying to make sure that that global influencing space has and amplifies the voice of local actors and local people, including children. Um, we have seen many examples where children's protection has been advocated for by local people in ways that are much more effective than just the same international agencies showing up and saying similar things again and again. And the advocating, of course, for adequate funding for child protection and humanitarian action, but also advocating that with donors that child protection is a central feature of every humanitarian response because we continue to see that marginalized often and part of those local voices need to be children 
we've seen many examples, and I know you have as well, where children have been able to bring a compelling voice into this discourse. It's not that they know best and they know everything, but their reality, not only do they have a right to bring their, for their voices to be listened to, they do bring unique contributions to the discussion. And we've seen that particularly effective, not only when it's about listening to children or consulting with children, but when decision makers are in an intergenerational dialogue, when it's an actual discussion uh, and, and where there's listening both ways and a discussion. And, and that's where we, I think the advocacy can have the most compelling kind of resonating effect with those who are funding uh, child Protection Humanitarian Action. And then finally, as you mentioned, we need to see the scaling and more effective uh, integrated multi-sectoral work uh, for achieving child protection outcomes. Many donors, some of whom are represented here, are showing an increased uh, support of multi-sectoral efforts to achieve child well-being or to protect children, including the protection of children. We're seeing more and more openness to including significant child protection outcomes in multi-sectoral integrated programming or even in programming which is for food security or education or health because donors are realizing and we all are, are seeing that child protection plays a critical role in achieving those outcomes themselves education outcomes, food security outcomes, uh, and health outcomes and others. And we're also seeing more and more evidence that multi-sectoral efforts, including child protection, are often the best way to achieve child protection outcomes as well. And so we want to see that. I think that's a, an important thing for us to be moving forward rather than in competition with the other sectors, trying to get the donor attention moving forward in a more integrated way. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, yeah, it's interesting that it reminds me, as, as you laid out the arguments about localization, about listening to children, about working with other se sectors, that are, these are all components of our accountability to children, right? So it's important that we, even though in our strategy we have a, a priority on accountability, but it's so linked with everything else that we do, we can't do our work not well or do it in silos and still say that we are accountable to children, right? Um, yeah, sure. And I'll try to add, there we go. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at in World Vision and been very convicted about is starting to model that more ourselves. In our own decision making, are we engaging children at the program level, at the national level, at the international level, in the sort of things that we're advocating for with governments? And we've seen really remarkable changes in that children, listening to children more intentionally in our decision making has made. And uh, last year when I was in Lebanon, I saw just some wonderful examples of integrated work for to achieve child protection outcomes and livelihoods and education outcomes together, but also asking children in a very structured way to be influencing our understanding of the reality and of the impact of those programs. So I just, just wanted to give a shout out to what I saw in Lebanon last year, which was, has really struck with me as well. Amazing. Great. Thank you so much. And, and Bill, you started talking a little bit about advocacy. Shima, I want to turn to you. And as you know, the goal of our strategy is on uh, making sure that centrality of children and the protection is a key element of humanitarian action. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to reflect on how advocacy efforts can be strengthened to prioritize children's protection in humanitarian action, including in the whole cycle of emergency preparedness, prevention, service delivery, and transition to development. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hani. I think, you know, um, three points here. But first of all, it's, Bill, you said that as well. It's about children's advocacy for themselves. And we heard that from our keynote speaker today. How powerful was that, right? So if we really listen to children today, they're going to tell us what works for themselves and what doesn't work. Um, there were times not so long ago when UNICEF actually, in our country programs, we would have a program that worked with children and young people and you know trying to get their voices uh, to be heard and that has actually diminished now because children do it for themselves right mm -hmm. so like our keynote speaker she was magnificent in the way she actually told us off a bit as well right i mean that's great and and more and more that's i think to me that's the most important part 
to listen to children and like you said meaningfully you know really what they want to say not that let's have them at the back of the room kind of thing but actually listen to them from where they're speaking about what impacts them and I'll give you a very quick example. Last year, when I was still in Iraq, early last year, we'd organized at the beginning of the year panel discussion somewhat like this with our, our partners and looking at who were those influences in the country um, that worked on themes that had an impact on children. So climate, conflict, and all of that. And so, and gender. And uh, we had the Canadian ambassador focused on gender because of, you know, the, their priorities in Iraq. And with me, the co-host was a 14-year-old. And at one point, the Canadian ambassador actually turned around and said to her, you know what? You were my biggest advocate because you were at a certain meeting when we were discussing budgets for education with the Ministry of Education. He said, and I put my talking points away because of everything you said to the Ministry, Minister of Education. And that's how powerful it is. So really, I think first is children's advocacy for themselves. Extremely important. We've learned it. UNICEF's actually embraced it. And, you know, it's so easy now because kids have smartphones. They have access to all kinds of technology better than we do sometimes. They know it better. So I think it's great. You know, you, you hear a 16-year-old in Cameroon speaking about um, conflict and, and advocating and you think, well, I'm sitting here, but you get to hear what she's saying. So we've got many examples like that. And I think that's really important. It, 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 you know, Bill, what you said, it just resonates with that. Second thing is, and often, uh, you know, in all these years in UNICEF, I've had other agency colleagues say to me, you guys are very lucky. Your mandate is on children. Everyone likes children. Everybody cares about children. And I think that really is the second point, the unifying power of children as a reflection of the society. Everybody wants to see children's well-being happen. And we actually see you can build coalition across opposing parties just on children. And that's been great. And that's, that's another focus for the advocacy, right? So as we just heard from Riyadh as well, you know, whether it's these rural communities or communities that are most impacted, or whether we are talking to governments as UNICEF often does, we actually can bring them together. And then, and then in my current role at the UN Security Council uh, working groups, when we hear, everybody's concerned about children. So I think that's that's another powerful one. Um, and often when, you know, you've got all these opposing parties, all these people conflicting, but they do agree on children and their well-being. Not always, often, that's also true. Um, and you can see that when you look at, when you're negotiating peace agreements or uh, for transitional justice, recovery plans, all of that, people do kind of settle when it's on children. I have never had someone tell me, children are not important, you can speak later. So I think that's, and then finally, I think, you know, we've all talked about this, Ria, do you, Bill, myself, honey, you also, about resources and how stretched they're becoming. And under such circumstances, I think for us, what has, what, what's become very important is just to, the argument that what works for children works for the entire community. But the converse is not true. What works for, you know, if you have programs which are designed for overall community and the adult population, doesn't necessarily work for children. So I think those are, those are very powerful arguments. In many ways, our work has been made easier by children. Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for those reflections. I'll just pick up on this element that I feel like what you're suggesting, and I think it's very true, and whenever it happens, magic happens, is when we just step away and allow for children. So rather than kind of thinking about children advocating for themselves, it's something that we have to do. Sometimes it's just us creating the space and, yeah. and or emptying the space. So they they're step up and, and do their work because they know how to do it, right? As you said, the, the, uh, Taisa, the girl who, the Brazilian girl, I mean, how powerful was that? 
and we also have a young lady here from Ukraine who we'll hear from uh, at a later stage. Um, great, so I'll just, for the sake of time, I want to do a, a quick final round with all of you guys. Um, and I want to start with you, Bill, but the question is the same with all of you. So if you can, in, in one, one and a half minute, uh, make us a bit more hopeful uh, going forward, because I feel like a lot of what we have talked about is very heavy and it's, it can drag you down. And then as we set the tone for the week, we also want to be encouraging of, of looking at the success that we have had and look, look at the solutions that we have found um, and kind of have this kind of more encouraging, forward-looking um, tone to the rest of the week. So if you can, either from your experiences, your examples that you have, or from things that, that you know about the sector, just give us a bit of hope and let us have the rest of the week be a very positive thinking week uh, of reflection. Yeah, okay, a minute to give hope. Um, there's a lot of things which inspire me and give me hope and have kept me going for the last 25 years. Um, one of them, a more recent trend that gives me a lot of hope is seeing in the human child protection humanitarian action work an increasing focus on the in working with an ecological approach, even in humanitarian response, to recognize the, the, the recognition by some donors and some, some international and national actors that there is actually a child protection system in place in every circumstance, even the most dire, even children on the move. If there was not, even more children would be dying or being seriously harmed. Something is protecting children. Of course, that system and that environment has been harmed and weakened by conflict and climate and other crises. But recognizing the local assets are still there protecting many of these children from what could be even worse in this terrible situation and i'm just seeing some a trend in some actors and some donors to say this is our starting point it's not just this external imposition gets back to the localization external imposition of best practices so that we can help make you protect your children it's recognizing we have some things that we can bring but we bring them in a way which strengthens local assets and when when I've seen that, again back to that Lebanon example, and I've seen in these very distressed communities, families, families themselves, and then of course communities and neighbors and, and, and civil society and even local government beginning to move forward based on their own assets and that the, the interventions were supporting that and strengthening that. That's very encouraging to me. It gives me a lot of hope and, and um, m makes me interested in continuing this work. But second, most importantly, I think for me, in terms of giving me hope, and I hope this is, it will also share a bit to you, is the hope that comes from the honoring the child protection and humanitarian action workers themselves. The entire sector, all of it, stands and falls around your work every day. And I am just so inspired by the courage, the commitment, the capabilities and the decisions that have to be made every day by people on the front lines, by people who are doing this work every day, showing up in what are often depressing circumstances or really overwhelming, still showing up, bringing, trying to bring and strengthen healing, hope, and protection of children. That's what gives me hope and gives me inspiration to continue moving forward. So I certainly, in response to that question, the first thing that comes to mind is honoring those who are doing the work in heroic ways around the world in such difficult circumstances. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. In rapid succession, we go to Shima, and then we'll end with Riyadh. Um, first of all, I really have to thank Bill for saying that because honestly, it is, it is all of you and everyone else out there. So thank you for bringing that up. I think three things, honey. Um, clearly hopeful, otherwise I wouldn't be here 24 years later. So extremely hopeful, please. Um, so there's one thing about understanding the reality and then on, on we go, right? So that's where we are. Local actors. I think, Riyadh, you talked a lot to that one, and I think that's really important. We are seeing that, as you said, Riyadh, and all of you across you know, where you work, that increasingly local actors are actually leading and shaping the protection work that we do, right? And collectively, we share that and we learn from that, so it's really important. Um, I've been traveling quite a bit, not, not as a tourist, 
but really to see the programs, uh, UNICEF and its partners programs across the world. And I did go to Indonesia recently and to Ethiopia. I talked to you about um, Ethiopia. In Indonesia as well, I saw, you know, where, where the issues are slightly different, you know, and they seem so far away from here. Uh, but again, you know, working with the local communities, working with the parents, getting them in, getting listening to the mothers, asking them, what are the issues with your children with special needs and how can we protect them from sexual abuse? And then creating with them what that looks like. So I really think that's, and we see it in different forms and different parts, same in Ethiopia, you know, so everywhere and I know each one of you have examples for that. I've also, so what, what's been interesting for me is I've seen partnerships across our organization. So UNICEF's partnerships with its partners and all, and they've been changing, you know, they've been, uh, because I was away from child protection for six years and then I come back and I see quite a bit of transformation actually, where these partnerships are, you know, closer to a bit what Riyadh described to the people who are the most impacted in the communities. Those are the partnerships that we have and looking at how that intergenerational thing works because we've learned from that. And I think that's extremely important, bringing that together. We also have young people, activists, frontline workers, um, all, you know, as very, clear partners uh, because we understand the importance of of them the caregivers the adolescents themselves so i think that whole local actor thing which is much bigger than as you said riyadh it's not a local ngo but what does that mean and i think that's one extremely important and seeing everybody get involved in children's well-being and child protection i think is extremely important the second one bill you started speaking about it, I'm gonna pick it up from you, is the inclusive systems, right? Child protection systems. I know when we say child protection systems, many people not in the child protection sector roll their eyes, but honestly, we have seen that when we have inclusive child protection systems, they actually are shaping the work that we do. Because one of the most important things about child protection systems are they're multi-sectoral. And you spoke to that earlier, Bill. It is, we, child protection system doesn't exist on its own. It actually does interact with the other systems. And we see more and more of that. And 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 amazingly, in in, in emergencies we see it before people used to say we can't do it in emergencies it's development work but no we do see that we see we see that in humanitarian context we see that in uh, cross-border context migration so i think people in our sector but others also have begun to learn that inclusive child protection systems are very important but what we must understand is they have to be intentional in enabling access for the marginalized, the invisible, the undocumented, basically to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind. Um, and it isn't so easy though. You know, it does, while we have to ensure that we transform legislation, policy, the way we design the services, it is also about going back down there and transforming people's mindsets. Um, you know, there's a whole lot based on assumptions and bias. So it's bringing in that social norms factor as well. And, and I think we're doing it more and more and we still need to do. Finally, it's prevention. You know, before we talk about prevention as though it's just a buzzword, or let's talk about prevention, let's put the word in there in the document, but it's much more than that. It actually has become um, very much part of programming. And um, when we look at child protection systems, we say the first part of it is about the prevention. So if we prevent, we will not have to provide all these services. So that is very important. How do you start programming from that point? Um, and that, 
addresses the root causes because we need to address root causes if we want to pre prevent. We need to understand what the root causes of harm to children are. And again, goes back to some of them are social norms, right? Very harmful social norms and practices, beliefs, biases, behaviors. We need, and we've learned with social behavior change becoming more professionalized, we've learned how to do that. Um, and, and then to understand that information is powerful, right? And when you put information in the hands of children and adolescents and caregivers can be super powerful, like your example, right? The person who said, no, this is what happens with child marriage. So extremely powerful if we just give them that. And finally, putting children and their protection at the center of humanitarian action, it requires as Bill said, and I'm going to say it all over again, humanitarian professionals from all sectors, all sectors who collaborate to prevent risks and harms that affect children. And we don't have the luxury of, say, the health system or the education system of just sitting within our system. We need to go across and beyond. We need to reach out to education, to health, to justice, all of that, just to make sure that we can actually collaborate to prevent those risks and those harms. The Child Protection Minimum Standards Pillar 4 provides concrete actions for all humanitarians and increasingly we share these common tools to help us achieve these goals. And of course the Alliance sets many of these aspects as priorities in its current strategy and the progress um, the child protection sector has made is really tangible. So lots of reasons to be hopeful. Thank you very much um, and I'll quickly go to Riyadh now for some additional yes. hope. I think we have already gone. Well, I, I'll try not to repeat what you've said. You've said much of what I wanted to say. Um, but <laughs> no worries. Um, for me, I think uh, localization is something that uh, more and more donors are being like uh, pro of, and they are trying to change their policies, they're trying to change their procedures to align more with local actors, be more local actors friendly, which is something great. We still have a long way to go, but we're getting there. Uh, the second thing is that um, we're seeing like more participation from the children's sides. In Syria, we have 13, 14 years old children who are shaping the transitional justice agendas, which is like most of adults don't understand what's transitional justice, um, which is which is very very good. Um, the last thing is that uh, um, we do have all the power here in this room we do have we, we know where to go we we have the experience we we've answered the most critical questions uh, it's the matter of uh, of how now not the what we've figured out the what with all of the work that we've done it's 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 the how and we have the CPMS you've you've uh, talked about it the backbone of of the sector which um, like uh, it, it can lead the response to any kind of crisis, right? So we don't really need to reinvent the wheel over and over again with every crisis that, that we face. I think those are enabling factors for us to, to maybe respond in a more efficient way in the future. We're, we're gathering learnings, we're, we're having more and more local actors in such force. Ten years ago, like it, it was a privilege for a local organizations to sit in such a room and then contribute to the uh, uh, standardization on the global level. Now we're pulling knowledge from the field, which is uh, uh, great for like a more like uh, uh, sustainable and adequate response in the future. I think this is what uh, like. Uh, um, still uh, uh, keeping me in, the, in, in this place saying, oh yes, we, there is something that we, we can do and we're doing it. Fantastic. A big round of applause for everyone. Thank you very much, Shima, Gil, and Riyadh.